There's still people joining, but I think this would be reasonable for us to get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, Adam, of course, if there are any technical issues, sound quality, then please let us know and we'll, we'll, we will address that. Uh, so as many of you, we've been involved in hundreds of these webinars over the last few years, especially with COVID. This is the first time our team is organizing one this large. So please be patient if there happen to be any technical issues. So far, everything seems to be okay. We're excited about the technology. We're excited about these possibilities. Uh, we may do something like this, for example, monthly. We haven't made a, de a decision yet, but we do hope to work with you more closely as Hunet users or people interested in the software to really build a community where we are addressing your needs. We're hearing your feedback, your suggestions for new features, new collaborations. So let me go to my slides. Um, so my name is uh, John Stelling. I am based at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. We represent the WHO Collaborating Center for Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance. We were first designated in 1985. Uh, we started the WHONET software with that name in 1989, though the software did exist previously. And uh, what we will want to focus on today is WHONET 2023, the new software. And specifically, we chose as our first topic for this webinar series, the WHO Glass uh, Surveillance Collaboration. The reason we chose this is that it's timely. Many countries have started to submit their data. Uh, many countries have been using WHONET for several years to submit data to the Glass 1.0 platform, but there have been some very large changes with Glass 2.0 that you will hear about. Um, I am sitting here at the WHO office, the WHO hub in uh, Berlin, and I'm sitting here with Barb uh, Tornindene, and she will be speaking later on the import of data. I will talk about the export of data from WHONET to the GLASS structure. She will talk about the import of GLASS data into the new DHIS2-based GLASS platform from WHO. Uh, but the members of my team include Adam Clark. He is the coordinator of this meeting and he is our software developer. He's been with us uh, since about 2012, software development, technical support, engineering, new directions. We have Rob Peters, who is uh, leading technical support, training activities, outreach to countries, and Dr. Ahmed Abushadi, who is a medical epidemiologist who supports in a lot of the technical support, but also building collaborations, looking for new opportunities and new directions. The work has been inspired by Dr. Thomas O'Brien, um, my mentor, and he is still very much a member of our team. So what we will cover today, and I do think we can finish early. We put two hours just to make sure we were not rushing, but we'll start off with some introductions, as I just mentioned. I will talk about some general high level summaries of WHONET updates in the last one, two years. Then we'll move on to the core of the presentation, which is how do we use the WHONET software to export data from GLASS, I'm sorry, to export data from WHONET into the GLASS AMR structure. GLASS does have, have many modules, as you will hear. There's one for fungi, there's one for gonorrhea, there are several others, antimicrobial consumption. I will briefly mention them, but the focus of today's presentation is the GLASS AMR module. Then I will finish, and then Barb will continue with the demonstration of the GLASS AMR import into the WHO GLASS DHIS2 uh, platform. So for wrap things up at the end, I'll mention possible topics I have in mind for future webinars. We look forward to your ideas and your suggestions. And then finally, a series of questions and answers. Throughout the whole time, you can enter questions, comments into the chat area. So please feel free to do that. I don't recall whether we set up the question and answers, but if you could do it either way. If you see Q&A, you can put questions there or you can put them into the chat. Adam, of course, if you could please monitor that because I will be not be looking at it very closely. Sure. Um, so I'm going to show you a presentation that I gave last week in Manila. So the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office organized a meeting on antimicrobial consumption and antimicrobial resistance for the approximately 38 countries of the WHO Western Pacific region, comprising primarily East Asia and the Pacific Island countries. So for that presentation, a little overview of WhoNet. It's a free software intended for Microsoft Windows for the management, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of microbiology laboratory data. 
with many applications, but a special focus on antimicrobial resistance. It can be used for things beyond antimicrobial resistance, and many people do that. Uh, HUNED is used in at least 130 countries, I think even now maybe 140 or more, for human, animal, food, and environmental samples. This, the map that you see there is quite old. We're in the process of updating it. I will mention a HUNET user survey, and we look forward to your efforts to make sure that our information is accurate. So while the data come from microbiology laboratories, and I presume many of you are microbiologists, the uses of the software are much broader than that. Microbiology, laboratory, infection control, infectious disease staff, epidemiologists, policymakers, researchers. So HUNET should not be seen only as a software for microbiologists by microbiologists, it should be used as data from the microbiology laboratory of value to anyone interested in doing surveillance of resistance and laboratory-based infectious diseases. So just one slide, some of the primary HUNET analysis and reporting features. HUNET can do simple clinical reporting on a day-to-day -day basis to give results back to clinicians. HUNET was not intended for that. HUNET was intended for analysis, but many people do use HUNET as their only day-to-day -day information system. HUNET allows you to calculate percent resistant, percent intermediate, percent susceptible, the disk diffusion, zone diameter distributions, or the MIC distributions. A scatter plot is a comparison of two drugs to similar drugs or to dissimilar drugs. That cross resistance is valuable for pharmacists uh, to look at first line agents, second line agents. What is the degree of cross resistance? People have been doing this for decades with tuberculosis, but the concept is relevant for any bacteria or fungus. Bonet has an analysis called resistance profiles where we look at many antibiotics, not only two antibiotics, we look at multi-drug resistance tracking. We have found that to be valuable in two ways. We look at multi-drug resistance in part because of its public health and clinical importance. What drugs still exist? What is the mortality associated with multi-drug resistance? We also look at multi-drug resistance as an epidemiological tracker. It allows us to say these bacteria seem to be similar phenotypically. We do not have the genotype, but the phenotype can be very suggestive of a possible outbreak. UNET has microbiology alerts, such as imipenem resistance, ampicillin susceptibility, quality alerts, important species alert, important resistance alerts. UNET also has statistical alerts for possible outbreak detection. We have many, um, many publications on the use of HUNET and this free SATSCAN software integrated into HUNET for the detection of community outbreaks or hospital outbreaks. This particular example comes from our collaboration with Argentina with Shigella Sone, specifically Shigella Sone, non-susceptible to the drug SXT. HUNET does allow for the export of data to many systems, including WHO Glass, that's the subject of today, or DHIS2. And we can also have a future webinar on HUNET's features for DHIS2. One of the valuable features we added last year, one feature we added many years ago, were user-defined reports John, I think we lost your audio. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, Adam, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, please continue. Great, um, not sure where, I'll just start here. HUNET have for many years has had Excel reports that could be defined by the user, but HUNET also has new word reports epidemiology, quality, FAO, uh, these other systems for making nice Word documents that can be shared with your collaborators. There can be weekly reports, monthly reports, yearly reports, pharmacy reports, microbiology reports. So these are some new features in HUNET. They don't introduce new analyses, but they package it in a way that has great value for sharing with your collaborators. Male, female age distribution, the distribution of specimen types and organisms. Here you see in the top table, the WHO list of priority resistance. 
critical, high, and medium priority resistance. At the bottom of that slide, you see some glass statistics. Uh, Multi-drug resistance profile statistics, outbreak statistics, and this is the antibiogram. So it's a one button solution. You press the button and you get this Word document with many features. This could also be an interesting topic for a future webinar. Uh, I'll mention very briefly the bathing software. I mentioned HUNET is used by many laboratories as their only information system. They enter the data into HUNET, they do clinical reporting, and that is their IT strategy. However, most labs in the medium and high resource country already have an LIS, a laboratory information system. In the low resource world, also many labs already have a system. It might be simple like Excel or Access. It might be a machine like a Vitec, a Microscan or a Phoenix, or it might be a lab information system, a commercial system from a national vendor, an international vendor, or developed in-house. It's an, it's an optical because all of these different LISs are not directly compatible with each other. Different hardware, different software, different codes, but it's also an opportunity. Somebody has taken the time and effort on a daily basis to get the data into HUNET. The electronic data have been stored. So the goal of Backlink is to convert data from a variety of different systems into HUNET for purposes of analysis and data sharing. So the success of HUNET around the world has depended on backlink for tapping into existing information systems. It also would make sense to have more uh, webinars on this topic. We also are making an, on well, I guess that's coming up soon. I did this presentation last week from Manila. So here you see countries in the Western Pacific region and their use of HUNET, uh, some of them like the Philippines, 1988, Vietnam, Malaysia, going back over 30 years. And then other countries started with the Fleming Fund, you know, Laos, Papua New Guinea, et cetera. Uh, we are now starting with many Pacific Island countries as well. And we gave an, an introductory training in July of this year. So current updates, we support our primary source of funding and activity is the Fleming Fund. This is from the UK Department of Health and Social Care. There are country grants, regional grants, fellowship grants, and we have what is called a strategic alignment grant. We support two regional grants, Captura for Asia and Radar for Asia and Africa, and our HUNED grant. We support, uh, phase one has ended, we're waiting for discussions on phase two, Combat AMR from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, coordinated by the University of Melbourne. American Society of Microbiology in Latin America, and a number of other collaborators that we have worked with over many years. We have developed a HUNET training center. We are now developing a self-paced online HUNET certification course where you don't need these kinds of webinars. You simply go to the training center, you register, you go to OpenWHO once the course is published, and you can at your own pace and in a variety of languages, take the course, take some exams, and then at the end, you can get a certif certification. This will be very valuable as staff changes. We offer new modules. So please follow this. It's a, it's a work in progress. Our videos and our PowerPoints are already available on the HUNET website. So you can already look at the work that we have started. The HUNET discussion forum, we would like this to be an opportunity for you to speak to us, to speak to your collaborators, to speak to your international colleagues, you can have private chats, public chats, questions and answers, discussions. So I will show that briefly, and that can of course be in a future webinar. And the HUNET user survey, that map that I showed you is quite old. So we are trying to get more updated numbers on the use of HUNET geographically, and also in human, animal, food, and environmental sectors. I'll just cover this slide right now, as long as I'm on it. So obviously once a year, we would love to do a once a year HUNET 2024 release of the new features from that year. A series of webinars about HUNET's analysis and reporting features, uh, DHIS2, the automation tool, so to automate all of your processes. We have an AST interpretation engine for doing automatic transfers of zone diameters and uh, MIC values into RI and S categories. HUNET uses those tables for doing interpretations, obviously. But you can also use the engine for your own LISs, for your own analyses. Many people struggle to do zone and MIC interpretation. So you don't need WHONET 
but if you can use the HUNET tables, this could allow you to do interpretations accurately and easily and maintain that over time. We can have a webinar on the HUNET community features, One Health features. We collaborate closely with FAO. There's a new initiative called INFARM, the International FAO Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring, looking at food and animals. We can also work with subsets of you for country specific webinars, region, language specific. Our team would be able to do English, French, and Spanish, and also Arabic. Uh, Dr. Abu Shadi is from Egypt. And in collaboration with you, of course, we can do any other language as well. So that's the end of my introductory presentation. And I think I will now move on to the HUNET software. And Adam, I am not following the chat. Um, should I continue or, or is there anything in the chat that I should address? I think everything is good. Please continue. Thank you. So I am presuming, uh, actually, before I go to HUNET, I'm just going to go to the HUNET website. You know, some of you are extremely familiar with it and some of you are not. For purposes of today, I'm sort of presuming that most of you already have some familiarity with HUNET download, installation, data entry, and you are interested in these GLASS features, but not all of you. Some of you saw this webinar and don't necessarily know that much about HUNET. So the website is hunet.org. Here you can download HUNET from the main page, right on one of these two links, the 32-bit version of HUNET or the 64-bit. 32-bit uh, is usually for people who have the older version of Office, 64, this, the newer version. In most cases, it doesn't matter. Sometimes it does, and we do give guidance if you do have any installation issues. Here on the main page, we talk about our user community features, including here the WhoNet user survey. Also, if you or your colleagues would like to be on our mailing list. In the main menu, you don't need to click here on software because the software is here on the main page. If I do click on software, you see the same software. So that's the, the HUNET 2023 on the left. Um, here in the middle is the beta version when we're testing new things, we're developing it, people are doing some testing for us. We have that middle version. Most of you do not need that. And then once it's ready, then we incorporate it into HUNET 2023. Finally on the right is the automation tool. Increasingly, we are encouraging people to automate analyses. Many people manually use HUNET once a year, or once a month, or once a quarter, and that's good. There's value in that. But in my own hospital, we have automatic downloads every day, automatic backlink every day, automated analyses, and automated notification alerts every day. So we use the automation tool for that. It is a separate software, so if you have an interest in that, you know, there is documentation, and perhaps we will have a webinar on that. Sometimes these things I say we might make a webinar. Some of them may not be a webinar. They simply might be part of our normal HUNET training course. So either through the training course or through these special webinars. Um, good. The next section is called the training center where all the materials, so you can download the PowerPoints, the PDFs, the videos once they are ready. Rob Peters has done an excellent job of putting this together. I've just needed to put my own time in to finalize it to send these off to open WHO. The discussion forum. You know, you can register to create an account. It tells you there's a link here for getting started. How do you post a message? How do you search? How can you work with us to create private rooms uh, for your country or for your language, etc.? I'm now going to close that page. Back on the HUNET page. About tells you a little a bit about HUNET, contact for contacting us. Let's see. I mentioned a few times OpenWHO. That's the website openwho.org. This is a WHO website for many courses on COVID, tuberculosis, antenatal care, vaccinations. Um, there are channels. One of the channels is antimicrobial resistance. Most of the courses there today are about stewardship but we hope to be involved in this so that there also becomes the HUNET training course here. I will now close that website. Now I'm going to move over to GLASS. I never remember exactly the GLASS website URL, so I simply go to Google and I just, uh, we'll go onto the Google page. If you just search for WHO GLASS, it's the first link that comes up. 
So that's the easy way to find it. Here you can see information on past reports, analyses, how does the country join. Um, the WHO AMR Surveillance Collaborating Center Network, of which we are a member. So there's a lot of resources here. There was a webinar last Friday on GLASS, on the GLASS manual. So that webinar will eventually be posted here once the link is, once they have finalized the video editing. Here at the bottom is a short summary of all of the GLASS modules. Under routine surveillance, there's GLASS AMR, antimicrobial resistance, national aggregate yearly statistics. That's the focus of today. GLASS AMC for antimicrobial consumption. Then focused surveillance on candidemia. We call that GLASS fungi. It's primarily candida in blood. GLASS EAR, early, um, emerging antimicrobial resistance. That what is what WHO calls focus surveillance. You can also do surveys and studies like EGASP is for gonorrhea. One Health includes the WHO E. coli tricycle project, including human animal food and environmental samples, especially water. The PPS, the annual point prevalence survey for hospital antimicrobial use. Burden of disease. I don't know what the difference is between these two different burdens, but if you click on the link, you'll you'll get further information. So I will now close the, and you can also get the GLASS 2.0 manual and other, if I click on Resource Center, um, the Resource Center will come up eventually. Well, okay, there, so resources, participation, etc including the GLASS manual. And I think the final version of that published August 31 was published quite recently. Country participation, you may or may not know if your country is currently reporting to GLASS. So if you go to country participation and then you wait for the web page to open, there will be an Excel file there. So here you can see the map. If I click on list of countries, I think, it is now downloading an Excel document. And you can see just as a simple example that Estonia started submitting data in 2022, yes, on AMR, and AMC in 2022. Eswatini did start submitting AMR data, but not yet AMC data. So on this, you can see whether or not your country has started to submit data. It will close that, and it will close that. And let's see, I am now going to go to a second PowerPoint. And here it is. So uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Carmen Pessoa Silva at the WHO office in Geneva presented this recently, uh, I think perhaps when at the Columbia meeting um, about the GLASS AMR module. I'm not going to do her whole presentation. I will only cover those slides relevant for today's discussions about the protocol as it relates to the IT perspective. Therefore, I wrote the word abridged. This is not her complete presentation. Here's a simple summary to what I already showed you on the website. In blue, you see the routine surveillance modules, including GLASS AMR, GLASS AMC, and AMC in national surveillance and hospital surveillance. In yellow, you see the survey modules. In purple, you see focused surveillance, including candidemia and gonococci, special studies in green, and event-based reporting, that's the early detection of novel and emerging resistance. The GLASS module has recently been updated and released and finalized. Some objectives here, generate data to inform AMR prevention and control, foster national systems and harmonize global standards, monitor global trends and resistance, inform the WHO model list of essential medicines, estimate the extents and burden of AMR globally, detect resistance and international spread, inform research and development of tools for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of infections. A number of people ask me if they should base their local and national surveillance around GLASS. And I generally say no, because the WHO GLASS needs are focused on the global needs. GLASS 1.0 was only for specimen types and eight pathogens and a limited number of antibiotics. So I suggest base your local and national surveillance programs around your needs. 
your pathogens, your specimen types, your organisms, et cetera. As long as you can do that, the information is of great value to WHO. If the reason we have this conversation today is simply to make WHO happy, it's not going to survive in the long term. To survive in the long term, there needs to be local value for your hospitals and for your countries. And GLASS is a valuable addition onto that. So some new things in GLASS 2.0. New specimen types, CSF, respiratory, rectal and pharyngeal for gonococci. Previously, there was in GASP a specimen type called genital that has now been separated into anorectal, urogenital, and pharyngeal to try to get pr for provide more detailed data about gonococcal resistance. Five new pathogens, Pseudomonas, Neisseria, Haemophilus, and Salmonella typhi and paratyphi. New antimicrobials from the uh, in three different categories of aware. The aware categorization is drugs should be readily accessible. That's the A. Or watched. That's the W A. Or uh, reserve. Limited use. You know, imipenem. You know, where you really want to preserve the activity in the long term, but use it where needed for patients in the ICU with sepsis at risk of death. There are a new data model, a slightly different data model, and a new questionnaire for people contributing data. In black on this slide, you see GLASS 1.0, blood, urine, stool, and genital. In red, you see the new additions of the three new of the new specimen types and the new red uh, organisms in the rows. Um, uh, Bob, I don't recall. Why are there black dots and empty dots? I think the empty dots are the new ones. I don't know, actually. Perhaps. Well, well anyway, the, um, there are black dots and and blank dots. <laughs> we'll figure it eventually. Um, and here I mentioned there are 11 access antibiotics, 18 watch antibiotics, and three reserve antibiotics. Um, we will talk today about aggregate statistics, national aggregate statistics, the national percent RIS for key drug bug specimen combinations. WHO does offer some new individual patient level data. The gonorrhea is patient level. The candida, the candidemia is patient level. So WHO glass was one thing in 2014. Now there are multiple modules ever expanding to address the, the, the needs as they evolve and as the countries are ready to submit. Nothing to say on this one. Nothing, it's advantages of isolate level data, but we will not be discussing that. There are also new, there's a new interest in molecular surveillance. So WHO is developing protocols for doing this testing and sharing results on them. The Glass IT platform, of course, will be the subject of the latter part of the presentation today. Um, DHIS2 started in South Africa in the early 1990s. It is now coordinated. It's a, it's, a, it's a very large international collaborative effort led by the University of Oslo in Norway. Um, and it's extremely widely used for tuberculosis, malaria, gonorrhea, mal um, antenatal care, vaccinations, um, COVID, um, ventilators, oxygen, ICU beds. So people in the public health world often are extremely familiar with the HIS2, but not in the world of antimicrobial resistance, which is often, it's just often a different world. And WHO has selected the DHIS2 platform as the basis of the global platform since this year, in part reflecting the very wide value of DHIS2 for those other diseases. This way, national ministries of health and other national you know, responsible groups have inside of one platform all of their data management needs. And you will learn more about the Glass dashboard and how to utilize it. That's the end of the slides that I got from Carmen. I added on a few additional slides to highlight a few data oriented points. First of all, RIS file, the antibiotic resistance file, more specimen types, organisms, and antibiotics. I already mentioned that. But some things have changed in addition. One is that uh, there used to be a desire, by a request by WHO to submit not only results on imipenem and meropenem, 
but also on the category of carbapenems. So in GLOSS 1.0, HUNED would export imipenem statistics, meropenem statistics, and also the group statistics of JO1DH carbapenems. J means antimicrobials, 0, 1 means systemic, typically intravenous, and DH refers to the carbapenems. So if you try to submit GLASS 1.0 data to the GLASS 2.0 data platform, you will get a blocking error because the ATC categories are no longer recognized. We have received emails from people that say, John, we tried to submit, but we get these blocking errors. And the reason for that is you need to update from the HUNET GLASS 1.0 to the GLASS 2.0, and then this will incorporate the modifications. GLASS 1.0 had a value called genital. The new GLASS 2.0 no longer recognizes the word genital. It is now categorized into those three values that you see here. So these are, these are crucial for the GLASS platform to understand. These are new values to be included. The samples file, again, new specimen types. There's a new variable number of in patients infected with a GLASS pathogen. Um, and who calculates all of those things automatically? You don't have to worry about first per patient and which organism and which antibiotics. The HUNET export takes care of all of that automatically. As I just mentioned, if you try to submit GLASS 1.0 files to the GLASS 2.0 platform, you will receive blocking errors, which will prevent the submission, as well as non-blocking errors, which are more warnings. I added a second slide. There are two files, as you have heard. The RIS file is the antibiotic resistance file, and it's for looking at the epidemiology of resistance, stratified by uh, gender, age group, and inpatient, outpatient, hospital infection, inpatient, outpatient, infection origin. That's the RIS file, and I hope all of you submit that. The second file is the samples file. This, has a, this file is not about antibiotic resistance per se, it's how many tests did you do? How many blood cultures did you do? Stratified male, female, and age groups. And they would like information on how many blood cultures you did that had glass pathogens, non-glass pathogens, and importantly, the negatives. By having the negatives, by having all of these, we can say that my laboratory did 100 blood cultures last month, for example. So counting the number of samples has a value for what we describe as diagnostic stewardship. Antimicrobial stewardship is the appropriate use of antimicrobials in patient care. Diagnostic stewardship is the appropriate use of laboratory testing services. So many places do very few blood cultures. That's unfortunate. Blood cultures are very important for guiding patient care decisions. If you have the total number, you can also calculate percent positivity. For example, in my own hospital, if we do 100 blood cultures, about 90% of them will have no growth. About 10% of them will have growth, so that's 10% positive. About half of those will be true positives and about half will be contaminants, you know, common commensals. Um, and as you could tell from my comment about percent positivity, that only makes sense if you include the negatives. So the samples file has little value if you do not include the results from all tests that you perform, and there's no need to upload the samples file to the GLASS IT platform. If your interest is in resistance, you upload the RAS file. That's the core and that's required. The samples file is extremely valuable if you have the negatives so that we can see how much testing do you do and what was the percent positivity. And the final slide that I put here is people are often confused about the WHO variable cold infection origin. There are two values. HO means hospital origin. CO means community origin. It is not as simple uh, as where was the sample collected. People usually do know if the sample was collected on an inpatient unit or an outpatient unit. And they say, John, why is HUNET calling this unknown when I know it's an inpatient unit? And I will explain in the following points. So how do we know if an infection is of hospital origin? Well, one approach is to take every single person's medical chart to review them, to make a decision that this person had a hospital infection, this patient had a community infection. It's impractical, it's time consuming. And in addition, there's a lot of variability between people. 
Some things are clearly community infections. Some things are clearly hospital infections. Other times we are really not sure. So this approach is really not very practical. The second approach, it's what we call an proxy approach, an approximate approach, um, an alternate definition. It's not a perfect, but it is simple to do. In the WHO definitions, which were based on the earlier CDC definitions, if a sample is collected in the outpatient setting, we will call it CO, community origin infection. If a sample is collected inside the hospital, it is not necessarily a hospital infection. If we happen to know the patient's day of admission, we can see if the sample was collected on hospital day one or two, or three or four. And the simple definition, it's a proxy, it's not perfect. If, it, if you have E. coli on hospital day one or hospital day two, we're gonna call it a community infection that required hospitalization, but it's still a community infection. It wasn't enough time to develop an E. coli infection in the hospital setting. You, you were hospitalized because of your infection, if it's hospital day one or two. If the sample was collected on hospital three or 10 or 30, we're gonna call it a hospital origin infection. So to do this, you need the hospital day of admission. So if the sample was, if the patient came to the hospital on Monday and the sample was collected on Friday, that's hospital day five. We would call it a hospital infection. If the sample was collected Monday, I'm sorry, if the patient was admitted on Monday and if the sample was collected on Tuesday and it was positive, we would call that a community origin infection. This definition is not perfect. For example, if the patient is hospitalized for three weeks and then the patient goes home and the patient has E. coli at home, that really is a hospital infection. It's a hospital infection that was manifested at home but we just don't have that level of detail about all of the patients. So in short, the WHO definition is not a perfect one, but it is practical, it's standardized, and it's something we can do if you have the date of admission. If you do not have the date of admission, and if it's an inpatient sample, WHONET will call it unknown. If the date of admission is there, WHONET will categorize it as community for hospital day one and two, or hospital for days three and later. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. Adam, I'm gonna move on to the WHONET. Uh, any other questions or comments in the chats that I should address? Um, let's see. I don't think anything that you need to address. I don't think anyone's asked a, a specific question. There's just a few comments about the hospital day uh, question. And I will read them at the end of the call. We should have plenty of time for that. So now I'm in the WHONET software. So hopefully many of you have seen this many, many times. And other of you, this might be familiar. This, this might not be familiar. And here when you open WHONET, well, one small thing. When you install WHONET, you see two icons. The WHONET icon I see in the lower left and the backlink icon, which I'll put over here. So WHONET is for data entry and data analysis and data reporting. And backlink is for importing data from existing systems and we are focusing today on WHONET. When you begin WHONET, it shows you this first screen where you select your laboratory. Um, WHONET gives you one automatically called the WHO Test Laboratory. And we use that for training and tutorials and practice. So feel free to do whatever you want with that. It's there for teaching purposes. To make your own laboratory, you can create, you click on new laboratory, you choose the country name, the antibiotics, disk MICE test, the patient care areas, the data fields, when it is very configurable, when it automatically asks first name, last name, date of birth, specimen date, specimen type. But you can remove questions that you do not need. If you're working with animals, you don't need the animal's first and last name. And you can add information that WHONET doesn't care about, but you might care about the name of the doctor, uh, the diagnosis. So WHONET gives you a standard list of human and or animal, human, uh, animal, food and environmental questions, and you can add to that list or remove from the list. So this is what we call configuration. New lab, I can open the lab for data entry and analysis. I can modify the lab to add or remove antibiotics or other information. If I'm a national coordinator, I can, I can create one laboratory and then make multiple copies, or I can delete it if I'm finished with it. Languages and dates, let me just go to languages and dates. If I go to languages and dates, 
And if I, for example, choose, you know, Vietnamese, everything is now in Vietnamese. If I click, for example, um, you know, Russian, everything is now in Russian. If I click, you know, and I'll just put this back to English. Uh, we support a very large number of languages. However, most of these were done with Google Translate. And Google Translate is very good, but it's not perfect. And there are mistakes in translations, or, or there are translations that are okay, but they could be improved. There are words like breakpoints, just diffusion, where Google Translate doesn't understand it. So if, you would, if, if this is important for you, we ha are happy to work with you to improve the translations. Put this back to English. Um, okay. There's also another way to create a laboratory. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that right now. This one called glass test. I'm just going to delete that. I'll show you how I can recreate it. So when you install Hunet, this is what you see, a single laboratory. I can create a new lab to make a lab, but there are also some shortcuts. I'm going to click on cancel. And where are the shortcuts? They're here on the file menu. New lab is the feature I just mentioned, where you choose from the beginning everything that you want. But if you are part of the European EarsNet or Caesar networks, we have pre-customized it with the data fields and the antibiotics that have been requested. When at Argentina, we have customized for them their drop-down list and their data fields. Glass AMR, I will come back to this one. Glass Fungi, Glass EGASP, the Pan American Health Organization Blood Culture Study, Vietnam Animal Health, FAO Animal Health. And if, if you want, if this is important for you, we are happy to add more, to collaborate with you to add more. These are basically templates. You can always do new laboratory, but in Hunet, we have already predefined which antibiotics, which panels, which data fields, which drop down lists. So I can choose, for example, WHO Glass AMR, new laboratory. I'll create one called United States um, oh, uh, WHO Glass Test Laboratory uh, Lab. <laughs> Glass laboratory, and I'll just call this TST. I can say it's human or human animal food environment, but I'll just call it US WHO Glass Test Laboratory, and I say OK. Do you want a standard HUNET configuration, which I would recommend? Because uh, there are two options. Do you want the standard HUNET configuration, including first name, last name, date of birth, uh, department, patient department, patient location? And most places do want that information locally. Glass doesn't care about that. Glass does not care about first name, last name, date of birth. So if your interest is extremely minimalistic, you can choose the glass option. For most people, they're not doing this only for glass. They're doing this for the local purpose primarily and their national purposes. So most of you would probably select the HUNET standard configuration. I say, okay. The only difference, but the only valuable difference between standard configuration and this one, I'll choose CLSI, say yes. Here it says antibiotics, and when I click on antibiotics, on the right you see the glass antibiotics. So we have predefined which antibiotics WHO is asking about. I can add more, you know, this is there, this is WHO's list, but you know, maybe WHO does not ask about, I don't know, oops, sorry. If WHO does not ask about AD Bactam. So you can add that to your local list. So the value of these predefined templates is that you could do the work yourself, but we have predefined it. Here you see the list of antibiotics. Here at the bottom is an option called panels. When you click on panels, you will see for staph Staphylococcus, these are the glass drugs in blue that they are requesting. Gram negative, these are the drugs. For enterococcus, these are the drugs. So click on cancel. Click on OK and save. I'm just getting out of that. So that's configuration. You do not need to create a glass lab to use glass. All, all any HUNET configuration can be considered to be a glass lab. It's a, glass is not so much a question of data entry, it's the export. So if you, you don't have to make any changes if you've already been using HUNET already. I'm now going to go to data entry, new data file. OK. And here at the top, you see the human questions. It only says human because I did not select animal food environment. 
if I did select animal food environment, it would change the questions depending on the answers. Human, it asked human questions, animal, it asked animal questions, environmental, it asked about water types, et cetera. You see the glass list of antibiotics below. If I go to organism and I say E. coli, these are the glass E. coli antibiotics. They ask for strep pneumonia, the smaller list. Step four is, I don't know why, but WHO is only asking for MRSA or not. All the other drugs have many antibiotics. I think WHO should ask more here, but uh, you do see the panels have been configured for WHO panels. You can further adapt this yourself. Erythromycin, superfloxacin, cotrimoxazole. So this is the core, but you can add on to the core or remove if, if there are certain things you do not need. You do see the date of admission here. If you fill that in, then WHONET can calculate community versus hospital origin. Then you click on exit. Exit. Now, finally, we get to the topic of this of this webinar today: is exporting data. How do I export data? So the data export features are here on the data entry menu. I'll click on data entry, combine or export, or encrypt. So this this feature does can do one or two or three things. I'm going to do the combine, export, or encrypt data files feature. On the left, I choose the files I would like to do. I go to data files. I can choose one file or 20 files or 100 files. You choose the files for your country because glass submissions is one big aggregation of the national statistics. So for example, here, if I select all four of these files, all four of them will be combined into the national statistics. And have to be one to one. Here I'm doing many, many files that will be combined together. But for purposes of the demonstration, I'm gonna choose the standard WHO test 2000 January file. And anybody who installs Unit, you have this file. It's part of our training teaching tutorials. I use the arrow key or I use double click. So now that's the file that I would like to analyze and include in my glass report. Or I can choose the 50 files. If you have 50 hospitals, you just choose all of the files into this one uh, analysis. Click on OK. If I want to, I can take the file and save it as a HUNET file, but that would be combining from HUNET into HUNET. I might have 10 small HUNET files. I want to combine them into one large HUNET file. And that's what this would permit you to do, save as a HUNET file. That's not what I'm going to show you right now. I can export it to the AMR module, which is the subject of today. Glass fungi, glass individual, glass eGASP. For fungi individual and eGASP, we have implemented the glass 1.0 protocol. We are now working with WHO to implement the glass 2.0 protocol. So these three have not yet been updated, but the glass AMR protocol has been. So that's the option I'm going to select. So here I can see the RAS file. I, many of you should turn off the sample statistics because you do not have the negatives from either one hospital or many hospitals. So without the negatives, the sample statistics file really does not provide a lot of the value that WHO is looking at. If I do have the negatives, then yes, I can include that. You can also separate the, you know, the blood, the stool, the urine. For example, it is very common that one laboratory at the national level is responsible for routine bacteriology, but a different laboratory might be responsible for gonorrhea or for meningococcal meningitis, for example. So if a different lab is doing the meningococci, you might want to remove certain specimen types or the genital ones. Good. I have data from 2000. Um, but GLASS is not really ready for data from 2000. GLASS, I don't know how far back it goes, but the 2000 here is not really, GLASS doesn't like 2000. I'm going to pretend it's the year 2022, and I'm not going to use a date filter. That way, we are basically lying to HUNET. We're telling HUNET that all of these data are 2022 data. Normally, you would not need to do that. Normally, if you have 2020-22 data, you say that the year is 2022, you use the filter, and then HUNET will include the 2022 samples in the export. So normally you don't have to, normally you do use a date filter to exclude any isolate 
which is not from 2022. In this case, uh, the data really are from 2000, so I'm going to lie to Hunet and say, Hunet, forget about a date filter, just call all of these 2022, and I'm just doing that for the demonstration. Okay, I've selected my data file or my many data files. Save as Glass AMR 2.0 for the year 2000. Data set number one. Data set one, um, you can go up to six data or five data sets, I guess. Many people do not use the feature here. Data set one is typically the national aggregate statistics. Sometimes people do break it down further, like the northwest of the country might be data set two. Or some labs have the positives and some labs don't, the negatives, I mean to say. So you might have a subset of laboratories that include the negatives. You don't want those, you, you don't want to make a samples file with all of the labs, but you might want to make a samples file with a subset of laboratories that do have the negatives, and that could become data set number two. There are other reasons why you might have data set one, data set two, data set three. Um, like if there are three different national networks for some of the very large countries or sub-regional networks. So 2022 data set one, and I say combine. After I click in combine, look at the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Combine. You see glass, RIS, blood, urine, stool. It finished the RIS analyses. Now it has finished the sample analyses. The files were successfully combined. Would you like to see the validation form? Yes, I would. Here you see a lot of information. Right now, it's a little bit too much for me to focus on. So what I like to do is I like to filter. I'm looking at the top of the RIS statistics, the overall averages. The pathogen I want to see is E. coli. Here you see the WHO codes. E-S-C-C-O-L is WHO for E. coli. I select the E. coli. Here I see the E. coli statistic from blood, E. coli statistics from lower respiratory, the E. coli statistics from urine. Let me just focus this down on the urine. So now here, this is where you can start to do your validation. Do these numbers make sense? 96% susceptible, 4% susceptible, intermediate, 8% resistant. So this is where people are doing their, val their validation at the highest level. That's why this is overall. If I say gender here, it's the same thing, but now you see male, female results are listed separately if you want to validate it separately. Or if I click on age group, you see the different age groups. Most people don't validate to this degree because it, you know, they do this for scientific reasons, not for validation reasons. It's just too much to try to validate manually. Origin, and now you see CO community origin, HO hospital origin, or UNK, unknown either because we don't know if it's inpatient or outpatient, or we know it's an inpatient, but we don't know if it's, we don't know the date of admission. Finally, at the bottom says exported data. What you now see here, this is actually the glass file. So every row in the glass file has an organism, a specimen, a year, a gender, infection origin, an age group, an antibiotic, and then the number in that category, the numbers in those categories. So this is a bit too much to validate manually, which is why people don't usually look at this, this level of stratification. For validation purposes, people usually just focus on validating the overall total numbers. You can copy paste these over to Excel if you would like, uh, exit. I won't do that. But as you can see, we now have these two files. The name of the file is glass. Oh, well, first, where is the file? That's at the beginning. By default, Hunet is putting all of these outputs into the Hunet output folder. You don't have to, you can browse, you can choose the location, but the default is the Hunet output folder. The name of the file is glass USA 2022 data set number one RIS. You can change it I and mean, you don't have, you, you, you might say this is only the blood. If you're managing blood and stool and urine separately, that's up to you if you want to change the file name. So I have my RIS file, here and I have my samples file here. Now that I've done that, I can exit out of, oh, before I do that, here's this export to DHS2. This is not the WHO DHIS2. We might rename this. We made as our own HUNET DHIS2 module. That's the purpose of this feature. We did that before the WHO DHS2. So this export to DHS2 is not the same as the WHO glass platform. 
some of you have an interest in the HUNET AMR DH2 manual uh, module, then we're happy to discuss that further with you. And that one, I think we will have a webinar. I'm going to click on exit. So yes, I have two files now. Where are those files? Well, I just told you where they are. They're here on the C drive in the HUNET folder. And they are in the output subfolder. And let me delete these other earlier tests that I was doing. So here you see the RIS file and the samples file. So HUNET has done its job. It has created a completely valid RIS file and a valid samples file. If I try to open this up in the Notepad software, it's the same thing that I showed you on the screen, except the columns don't line up as well. But this is what the glass file looks like with the antibiotic results. As I said, every row is a year, a specimen, an organism, a gender, origin, age group, antibiotic, and the RES numbers. That's the RES file that all of you should develop for submitting to GLASS. The other one is the samples file, and the samples file does not keep track of the organisms. It does not keep track of the antibiotics. It simply keeps track of how many bloods, how many urines, stratified by age, gender, inpatient, outpatient. Okay, so I'm gonna take a little break here because I have shown you how to export from HUNET to the GLASS, RIS, and sample files. So I'll ask Barb to take over and she has her own files that she will use for the, for the demonstration. Okay, let me turn off my screen and, and I will also turn... turn. What is that, Adam? I'm gonna turn off my microphone. Okay, we have a. We do have a. Turn this on. This on. Try like this. Yeah. I saw there was a question in the chat also about submitting. If you have, if you have labs uh, that use different um, testing profiles, so if you have lab that use CLSI and UCAS. Yes, you can group them together because as I will show you then in in this is one of the question of the question and you can report actually that you're using both CLSI and UCAS in your country. Uh, Barbara, I have not introduced you. Yes, you, you have. Well, you I said have. Barbara, what is your uh, what is your relationship with glass? And... So I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I start working with glass in 2017. So I was actually part of the first data call. Um, I've been the epidemiologist for them for many years. I've worked on the GLASS report, on data calls, on burden, and I left um, last September to pursue other things, but I'm back as an external consultant part-time um, to work on specifically on the new platform. Um, as John mentioned, the new platform is a DHS2 based platform. Um, the front end is not actually DHS2, so we have customized it to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, but on the back of that, there is DHS2. Um, as John mentioned, we have a number of modules, but uh, today I will present the AMR aggregated module. Um, so, you want to come this way? Yeah, so I can see your screen. Yeah, okay. Ah, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And if someone, if maybe Adam can just tell me if you can see the platform uh, main page for a country. Yes, I can. We can see. Okay, your perfect. OK, so um, I've chosen the Republic of South Sudan because I was recently well, there for uh, a mission. Just a moment. I, I see I see your screen, but. Um, is it supposed to be a web page? Sorry, you might have multiple screens. Yes, which one are you seeing? It's 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 um, yeah, Adam, it's just one screen and you are showing the web page, I believe. Yes. OK. Is this a web? You can see the, the glass web page with the with the platform the top of the screen says glass v2 amr user guide and fp 
this is the word file and then can you see the the online we cannot see the online okay. so i think then, we can only see the word file so you might want to move yes. the online thing to the other yes. screen sorry about this yeah adam there's only one screen it's a laptop no, no, no it's 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 mac actually and oh, it's okay. always a mess for this and it's a little bit annoying sorry about this now i have to find you again okay Might be easier to try to reshare if there's a menu of things to click. Yeah, it's just okay. I found you again. Sorry, it's just the Mac. It's it's sometimes because it has multiple screens. It's not sometimes a bit funny. Okay, Windows screens. Right, so share screen. Yeah, but it shouldn't be this one. But anyway, it's fine. Okay, can you see this one now? Uh, let me just put this here and you see. Can you see this, the, the web page now? Yes, we see the web page now. Thank Sorry you. about this. It's just Mac has got like different desktop and sometimes it gets a little bit messy. Um, OK, so as John was mentioning, uh, this is the new Glass platform. It was launched purposely for this data call actually for this year data call so it was launched in june um, 2023 um, it's supporting the data call from this year for which um, we're still not requesting all the new combinations all the new specimens all the new pathogens that are included in the manual 2.0 but it's true that because the platform was designed for 2.0, there are some changes that have been made compared to the data set that you would submit um, until last year. So we don't accept antimicrobial classes anymore. This because with aggregated data, we felt that um, the results were not really reliable. Um, and um, the genital specimen has become urogenital for this year, but I believe that my colleagues have given a um, few webinars about the, the glass data preparation and the beginning of the data call. I was not part of this, but I'm, I'm sure that was done. In any case, um, if you have problem uh, blocking error, you can either use the report bug um, button here, and that kind of goes straight in kind of our sort of like bugs, um, list for um uh, for us to resolve the issue or you can just email us and uh, you know we are offering um technical support for the data submission as we do every year to try and see where the problems are so um yes i'm just i'm just going to move forward so this is kind of the main page uh, sorry i'm just submitting people um that you will see uh once you have acquired your user account um parentheses um as this is a new platform we could not migrate the user accounts from the previous platform so we have to recreate new users so the way that we're doing it right now also to be sure that we have an updated list of national focal point is for the national focal point to email us the name and the email and possibly other contacts for which we need to create it to create a username and if some of you is a national focal point you might have received few emails about this in the last few months and I've seen I've seen actually some NFP like in 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 the call. So once you get your um, access, um, this is, as I said, um, the front page, the opening page or landing page of the glass platform has a menu on the left um, with kind of sort of like the different um, pages uh, that are offered um, in the platform. Um, as John mentioned, Glass doesn't collect the uh, data set uh, from 2000, but we do collect the data set from 2016. Um, in fact, uh, the decision was that for the country that have already submitted data from 2016 to 2021, as we have already validated the data, we will do a kind of sort of like single um, upload of all the historical data after this, this data call so that you will be able to actually see all the data that you have reported to Glass. This is not available yet, but it's going to be done, um, I think, in, in November this year. But just to give you a sense, um, if you look at the data submission um, 
or the data file history uh, or the data submission history. You, normally here you would see like a list of all the years that uh, you can submit data to. OK. This is funny. Why is it doing this? OK. Sorry, this is the training version and sometimes a little bit fidgety. I don't know why. The first time I actually use this myself. OK, we're back. Uh, as I said, this is the training version, sometimes a bit funny. So um, the way that we have structured the data call, um, we have kind of sort of a in, ingrained, like a, a kind of sort of stepwise approach that the country need to take for to, meet, to submit their data. Um, from this year, the uh, submission of the questionnaires uh, that collects kind of sort of data on the implementation of the surveillance system at national level, it's mandatory. Uh, I don't I don't want to go too long here because it's not a glass webinar, but country might might know that um, they can enroll in glass even if they're not submitting AMR data per se, but they can actually uh, enroll in glass and start submitting data about the status of of their surveillance system. It can be also early steps of, you know, creating, um, a, you know, uh, assessing national focal points or creating a national reference lab and so on. OK, so to submit the data, we click go, but we could also use the the menu on the left. You can see here like kind of sort of like a summary of um, everything that has been submitted or not submitted for this data call. We accept up to six data set for AMR data, and it's related to what John was explaining to you before about the number of different data set and of course one questionnaire. As I said, the questionnaire is mandatory, so generally the first step for the submission should go through the questionnaire, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you can access the questionnaire through this tab or this tab, go to questionnaire, you view the questionnaire. As I said, it is mandatory. There's a number of questions here. Um, this response kind of an answer to the question before, so you can actually submit data um, from laboratory data using both UCAS and CLSI or even others, um, you know, and then and, and so on. Um, we have questions about the kind of status of the healthcare response in your country independently from AMR surveillance. So how many uh, acute healthcare facility do you have in the country? How many of these are hospitals and so on? This kind of give us a sense of, you know, how is the country placed in terms of like healthcare response? Uh, and then if you actually submit AMR data by clicking these questions, you will have another question similar to the one number five um, that asks you specifically for the facility reporting to AMR data to GLASS. So the same, how many hospitals are reporting and of this, how many inpatient admission and so on. So we kind of have divided this because it does give us a sense of coverage. Uh, you know, we are receiving data from the countries, but we don't know if it, we're receiving data from 1% of the healthcare facility, 20% of the healthcare facility, 100% of the healthcare facility. So we have combined this information this year to get a sense of like the coverage and the magnitude of the surveillance in the country. Then here we have the possibility to upload the data sets. So, um, here we have um, a page where you can choose your risk file and if you have your sample file and you have to define the data set. Um, so if I select file here, it will go to one of my files. Uh, what did I choose, for example? OK, this file, I think this is South Sudan, so. I had prepared a few years, but so here I have a risk test file for San Sudan for 2022. And then I think I also have a sample file. So I'll choose the sample file that is related to the same year. 
uh, here. Now, as John was saying, um, it's not very frequent, but we had we had country where the surveillance system are separated by pathogen. And so it is true that you might have the sample file for a subset of your data. Um, and in this case, you, for example, you have blood risk file for Staphylococcus aureus, uh, but you don't have actually the sample file. So you don't have the corresponding number of, of blood sample that have been taken. So you can submit that as, I don't know, risk file data set one. And then you have another file for streptococcus pneumoniae, blood, but you do have actually information about your blood sample and then you can submit those as RIS file, batch uh, data set two and sample file data set two. Okay, sorry. And whenever you say RIS file, that's the RIS file. There, sorry, that's the RIS file. Okay, so you click continue here. Sometimes the platform takes a little bit long. Uh, this is because the data will go to DHS2 and then they will go to the XMART at WHO. I'm not going to go into the details of uh, like, like the database structure. Um, so you just have to be a little bit patient. We have even put like a little message here. Sometimes the page might go, uh, might ask you, it might go unresponsive and it might ask you to continue. You just leave it open and you wait until the, the file it's it's um, uploaded. Um, we actually managed to get it much faster than it used to be before. Also, we had the same issue with like deleting files. Um, it, will it will take a little bit longer because we'll have to go back to the database, capture the data and, you know, kind of sort of like reimport it. So, yes. You just have to be a little bit patient here. Um, it's going through some consistency check, uh, which for now are basically is checking the combination between specimen, pathogen and antibiotics. So you might know, but Glass has kind of like a preset uh, of combination that can be reported. Um, so here we have gone through the first consistency check. There's no blocking error, no blocking warning for the RIS file or the sample file. Um, so a blocking error, I'll give you an example, would be, for example, if you have collected um, stool and Staphylococcus aureus. I mean, I, I'm making like a complete wild, but you know, it, it, it would stop the file because we actually don't connect this, this type of combination. Or as John was saying, if you're trying to submit like an antibiotic combination that it's not actually in the glass list, the platform will stop it. Um, and, and Barb, one comment here is that WhoNet should never have a blocking error or a non-blocking error because you're not in control. WHONET controls these organisms, these antibiotics, these specimens. So with WHONET, you should never see these kinds of errors. Uh, on the other hand, countries that make glass files on their own, people use Excel, people use their own programming, then they can have blocking errors or non-blocking errors. WHONET should never have those because we have done it to be compliant with the WHO platform. So unfortunately for this year, uh, bear with us. Uh, if you have created your file before the new WHONET version, you might still have the issue of the antimicrobial classes and the genital specimen. But uh, John has been responding to this. I've been responding to this also on my side. So we're trying to kind of like, you know, match it um, while we go um, to ensure that most of the country are submit we're not going to get blocking errors. There shouldn't be blocking errors, you know, in this case, it's just a discrepancy, you know, between moving from one system to the other, which is it's kind of like normal, you know, it's it's a bit of a road test. So um, we go ahead here. Um, this the extra step, um, it's not really useful for the aggregated data module. It's going to be more useful for the individual data level module, which will be launched next year. Um, this is because the platform has the same structure. You will have basically the same page with kind of sort of different tabs um, in order to submit, you know, fungi, uh, aggregated, EGAS, and so on. Um, and this step, it's going to be important for the individual level data because we will be including some validation uh, check of, of the data. Like if you're 
familiar with Caesar or ESNet data submission, it's it's pretty much the same. For example, if your MIC do not match your RIS kind of sort of outcome, then the platform will stop it. So we will inc include, you know, kind of sort of um, a way to really validate not just the structure of your data set, but also a little bit the quality of the data that you are reporting to us. So again, uh, the platform is doing its own work. Um, I'm just thinking, OK, so it's running the analytic. It, you can see that this is the summary of the line that were important. I mean, in my experience, sometimes this is useful for countries that for some reason have very different numbers um, to kind of go back and, and try and double check what happened um, with mainly the conversion in from another type of, of data set to glass data set. They might have lost something or they might add it some line. It doesn't happen very often, but it's just to give you a sense of, you know, the magnitude of the data that you're submitting. And we go to continue. Now, this is a very important step. It's been uh, included this year. Um, so you actually have to physically submit the data to Glass. Uh, if you are familiar with the previous platform back in the days, we were just asking you to update. There was a validation kind of step, but it was not mandatory, so the country would not always complete it. But this year, you actually have to uh, to validate your data and then actually submit it to Glass. We have created a, a validation report um, this validation report gets updated every five minutes, I think. And um, you can see the time here. Uh, it has like a kind of sort of like overview of, you know, the data that you have submitted. Um, you can filter the country, you can filter the year. Um, we have actually created a user guide for the NFP that explain you how to filter the data if you want to just see one year or, or, or the whole five years. As you can see, this it's kind of like uh, uh, on a five years basis. It's it's what every country is going to see, but you can filter out, for example, just 2022. So it's just like these are the I would call them like typical. Uh, proportion of resistant glass uh, graphs that we have always um, we have always used for the glass report, for example. So it's just, you know, the proportion of, you know, proportion of resistant bloodstream infection due to Staphylococcus aureus, 31.9% uh, is due to oxacillin. If I remember correctly, with the glass 1.0 platform for the external users, it was a platform for them to update, upload their data, but they didn't get, there was not, there was no interactive database. Whereas class 2.0, there seems to be more visualization tools. Well, it's kind of, so in the previous platform, we did have uh, some visualization. Um, actually, the previous platform had a little bit I had more tools which we we'll probably will add because this is basically um, the visualization that we use for the glass report. The previous platform has also had some tool to visualize data that you know it might not have we might not have needed for the glass report per se, but they were giving like more um, flexibility to the country to uh, to visualize their data. Mm. Um, There's one strength of DHS2 is its visualization abilities, yes. customization, yes. and also multiple levels. I, I don't know exactly what's in so, mind for the Glass platform, but regional analyses, country analyses. So at the moment, the, you know, because we launch it and, and at the moment, the visualization, it's kind of sort of fixed. Um, I mean, you can you can go back to the DHS2 uh, visualization page, but you won't be able to, you, you know, a national focal point would not have the right to actually change right. it because this, this questionnaire is the same. It's just one template that is the same for all country. In fact, you know, if I open it as a user, I would see the data from all the country that I've submitted to the platform. You know, it's kind of like one big, report that they get filtered based on the user rights, you know, so um, you can go back 
and look at the page that has been used in DHS2 to, to create the graph, but you can't change it because if you change it, you will change it for your countries. Thank you. Um, I think in the future, the idea is to start adding, uh, you know, other tools that the country can start using, you know, like that that will not actually then be brought into the platform. But, you know, these are the scores. And what I like about DSGS2, DS and as you said, is there's so many more tools that, that can be added, and there's so much more flexibility, you know, and this is for us, it's just our first step. And in addition to the global view and the national view, I also like the concept of a regional view. Yes, of course. The WHO regional office, etc. Yes. So in this case, for example, as I said, you know, the, the way that you see the report is really based on your rights. So a national focal point will only have the rights to filter for his own country. In fact, will automatically see only his own country. Um, a regional user from a regional office will be able to see all the country in his region in one go. And then if he needs to filter, he can filter then country by country, you know. So so it's it's about, you know, um, accessibility and rights in terms. The report is just one. But me, I can see global, I can see regional, I can see, you know, because I'm a ultra user mm -hmm. from from the global kind of perspective. So I can see all the years, all the data that have been submitted. Uh, you know, it's it's I can even change the graph, but this is not the point. So here we have tables with summary. We also have put some uh, kind of sort of like stratification. Um, the graph, you know, the only thing about the OHS2 is that, of course, the, the graphs are not as nice as the graph that you were making R, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, visually, they're still like a little bit, you know, clunky, but, you know, they're very easy to use. And if you guys have used Power BI or Tableau, it's, it kind of works in a, in a very similar way. So this is kind of like a way for a country to have a look at what they have submitted, if they're happy with it and so on. And there is a last step uh, that normally will be here, but I don't see here where you kind of sort of like get to a page where you have to click on submit data to Glass. Now, the other thing that is important this year, we have put like a kind of sort of uh, mandatory request for modification of the data. So if you have submitted the data to Glass and you want to modify your data set or you have made a mistake and so on, you have to request us. There is another button somewhere in the platform where you actually request it to us and we get an automatic request in our kind of sort of mail notification. We reopen the data call for you. You can then change your submission and resubmit it to us. This is because we want to be sure that during our validation process, data do not get changed without us not knowing which happened in the past. Uh, and so it, it just kind of sort of gives you know, more control for us, you know, the, the process is cleaner, you know, it, it's, you know, we are on board, you know, if, if you need to do something, if you need help for something, if you need to change something, we can kind of sort of communicate back and forth. So there are opportunities within the website to post notes and questions. Yeah, there is a report bugs here that can be filled in. I don't know if you can, you know, it's, I, I really love it when I was testing it, you can kind of sort of highlight the area that you're not happy with, and then it will go into kind of sort of like a bar report box where you can put the title and the description, and then you can submit it, and it will get directly to our kind of sort of uh, box. Yes, and for people who do not have access to the website, the, the general email is what, glass at who.int? Yes. Yeah, so glass at who.int for questions. And that information is also provided on the WHO website yes. about glass. Yes, yes. So I think, you know. The, you, you showed me a feature earlier today that I was not familiar with. I thought that we could only submit 2022 data. And you showed me earlier today yeah. That I, you can change the the history. You go to history. Yeah, I can't open it here for some reason. So I will just go into the normal platform, and I hope that Argentina will. Right, because people have often commented that there's a deadline. The deadline refers to data to be included in this past year's report, 
But of course, I, I, is, I, I imagine the platform is open 12 months a year. Is, is that correct or no? No. Does the platform close? The platform actually does close because okay. at some point we need to kind of validate the data. But However, what about historical data? So you can see here that, uh, you know, country can actually go into the data submission history and, you know, they can submit data from the previous year. If you click on 2021, it will take you exactly to the same kind of sort of like mm -hmm. structure of stepwise approach. Um, at the moment, we haven't really thought, I mean, this is not up to me also, because as I said, I'm, I'm an external consultant, so I'm not part of this uh, anymore. Um, I, 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 we haven't decided if the data call is going to be open uh, all year for other year submission. Mm -hmm. um, it is true that with, with this platform, we have much more control of what is submitted and what is not submitted, because as I said, it has to be like formally. I think here I have, okay, uh, advanced. Uh, yeah, so in the advanced page, for example, as I was saying before here, you know, Argentina has already submitted their data. If they want to change the data, they will have to request it to us. So this is the same for every other year. So we have much more control on what is coming in and what is not coming in. We have uh, tables with updates on, on what is being completed and what is not. So it might be that in the future, you know, the data call is going to be open more flexible to accept, you know, especially submission of, of previous year. I, I, to be honest, I don't know, because also this reflects on what has been reported on the glass report. You know, I mean, this is bigger conversation about do we want to go back and revise our historical data or not? You know, I mean, TB does it. Um, they go back and they include uh, historical data, but this is a conversation that that I think they still have to have. But um, what I can say is that for the country that have reported uh, data in the last five years, we were going to upload them, you know, by by November. Uh, otherwise, here is how you do it. And then, you know, you can see the data file history. Uh, in this case, there's nothing that I not found. Let's see. Validated. So you see, like, uh, this is the file that, that um, Argentina submitted. Um, it still has to be validated by GLASS, and this is going to be done after the end of the data call. There is a period of validation, of course. And in fact, he's actually on the call now, <laughs> Ezekiel. The data manager is on the is on the Zoom call right now. Alejandra? Oh, uh, um, Ezekiel Tudori under, under, under Alejandra. Ah, okay. Corso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry if I'm using Argentina. It's like it's, like it's a, one of the first countries like in the list also because they put funny names, um, you know, and then in the reports country going to be able to see the five the historical data, you know, once we, we will have uploaded them and so on. But I think, you know, in the future we, we will try to add some more flexibility in the visualization. And, and for now, this is what we need for the submissions for the report of this year. I think more or less this is the country information, you know, just the national focal point, you know, when since when they've been active and so on. So, yeah, this is pretty much it. So ready to move on? Yes. Okay. Great. So I'm going to shift this. So uh, we plan to finish in an hour and a half and then leave an extra half an hour for questions and answers. So feel free to drop off the call. And then I will start by going through the uh, Adam, if you could help to gear what I'm talking about next. Early questions can focus on today's topics, AMR, glass, et cetera. I, we're scheduled till two o'clock. You can drop off whenever you would like. And we're happy to answer questions on any other HUNET topic as well. But at least to start off with the HUNET 2023 export and the DHS2 import, those would be the priority questions for now. So Adam, could you just hear us on any questions where we should comment? There's been a few questions that I've asked um, people to put in the Q&A section here. So let me just scroll through the meeting chat and see if I can find them. Uh, no, I, I speak French. So we have a question. How do how does Glass 
categorize the RIS of polymyxin against glass um, pathogens? Excellent question. And actually, Bart, this is a question I was going to pose for you as well, for not for you, but to the GLASS team. There are certain breakpoints that UCAST has that CLSI doesn't, yeah. and vice versa. There are also old breakpoints that have been deprecated. And for example, in the case of CLSI, I remember approximately that there were disk, maybe MIC breakpoints for colistin and polymyxin, some of which were later deprecated. So these are examples of antibiotics that are on the GLASS protocol that do not necessarily have validated methods. If it is valid for neither CLSI nor UCAST, it may make sense to remove it from the protocol. If it has breakpoints for one but not for the other, we may want to leave it in. What happens in HUNET is if you test an, an organism with an antibiotic without a breakpoint, HUNET will put the interpretation as question mark. For example, if we have some new drug called berlinomycin with zone diameter of 20 millimeters, HUNET will say, I don't know what that is. I'm going to call that a question mark. So, Barb, there are examples where there are simply no breakpoints, but they are on the class protocol. Yeah. And HUNET will call them question mark. And the polymyxine, I think somehow it was still recorded as a, the class, you know, uh, in 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 the variable file. So I'm I'm this is I I'm not sure because it, it would not be me actually it would be our microbiologist, which is Daniel, that took care of that. So I'm not sure how that is going to be resolved. Right. But um, if you pass the question, if you send the question to the glass email address, then we will make sure that the person that is actually in charge of this, which is our microbiologist, get back to you. Yes, um, and, and Adam has already started to compile a list yes, of things yes. that neither has a breakpoint yes. and or one has a breakpoint, but the other does not yes, separated for disk and MIC. So you as an end user, you don't have to worry about it. Hunet will put the correct R, I or S or question mark. And then WHO will simply need to decide whether to ignore those statistics. If it's all 100% question mark, then obviously WHO will not be reporting on that. Yeah, you know, and as everything, you know, like we have learned so much in the first five years, just on the few combination that we had, you know, like this is going to be another period for us to actually try and understand how to better interpret the data and we might end up like changing or removing something based on what the country is uh, reporting and the doubt and so on. So it's, it's you know, it's the first year of the GLASP 2.0 next year. It, it's going to be like um, a little bit of a testing ground for the methodology, you know, I mean, before we get it right. I do see one question in the chat, the last most recent question. Some of us have not been able to capture most of the knowledge shared in the presentations. Is there any other way we can have access to the presentations, please? A few comments. I do apologize. I speak fast. I grew up in New York, so I tried to slow down. I am not always successful. Um, yes, we will make the so Adam, you can we can figure out later how it will be, but we will have on the Hunet website the, the video recording the PowerPoint presented. When you install HUNET, Adam, I think it's there. We don't, well, there are many tutorials in HUNET. One of the tutorials is HUNET and the glass export. So there is, a, so instead of us teaching you through the webinar, there is a printed tutorial on the steps that we covered today on the HUNET side of things. On the DHIS2 WHO side of things, Barb, I'm sure there are documentations about those steps. Uh, well, yeah, we have we have prepared the user guide and we have, uh, you know, uh, we actually have a repository. Maybe I should even put the link here where we have a couple of recordings of the meeting that we gave for the Afro region, I think, and another one maybe for the uh, PAHO. Certainly the Afro region where there is also a French translation. And then we have the user guide that you know, I kind of sort of prepared for the national focal point. Um, yeah, we will put the HUNET materials on the HUNET website. For the WHO, we could put them, but I think instead we'll just put the link to the WHO website. This is the WHO website where you will find these materials. Yes, I think I will need to discuss, we will need to discuss with our team manager to update. So Adam, I did jump the queue. What question did you have for us next? 
Um, well, I think maybe related to the polymixin question, um, about four or five up from Adame, um, I think that was really related to um, if there's a different method. So, you know, like it has a non standard dilution, for example. So, I think I explained in the chat that in that situation, you would define it as a user defined drug if Hunet doesn't know about it and set your own breakpoints. So, I'm not sure if that is what Glass would like to receive, but that is technically how you would get R, I's, and S's in Hunet um, if that's the only data you have. So, if you could comment on that. For a drug that's not in Hunet or a drug by a different methodology? I think it's by a different method. Um, you see, it's just a question up here that references the BMD method. Oh, OK. Um, I, if I, I, without knowing the details of the method, my guess is that might be a method for determining the MIC, but you would still use the corresponding CLS or, or UCAS breakpoints. I may be wrong, but my first guess is that the BD, the BMIC method doesn't have its own breakpoints. Uh, it's just a method for determining the MIC, though I might be wrong. Um, yeah, if if it's the same drug, HUNED would automatically use the existing valid breakpoints, or alternatively, the user has the ability to overwrite them. Um, so if there are no breakpoints, one approach that, as Adam said, is you can make a user-defined drug. Alternatively, you could use the official WhoNet code for the drug, but use your own user-defined breakpoints. Uh, as a small example of this, for example, tigacycline is a very important new drug. There are UCAS breakpoints for it, but there are no CLSI breakpoints for it for historical reasons, but there are FDA breakpoints. So you can go to WhoNet, antibiotics, breakpoints, modify breakpoints, and just manually type in your own breakpoints. For example, salmonella, there are some antibiotics where the international enteric pathogens people have agreed on certain breakpoints where CLSI and UCAST do not make recommendations. For example, streptomycin, a rather old drug. Streptomycin important for uh, epidemiological tracking, but just not so important for clinical therapy. And then maybe if you could start at the message at 835. Well, I'm not actually looking at the chat. Um, Adam, could you maybe share your screen? That would be helpful. Sure. 835. Yeah, because Adam, Adam's been tracking it. So if he shows us the questions that. Well, it's just down here at the bottom now. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this any No, it's too small. I, I can't read it. I tried to make it a little bigger for you. Well, in fact, I forgot about that. When you share screens, it typically does not share the chat. It's here. So you can either check the chat on, on your side. Um, yeah, by 835 for you. So, so how does that, what is the first sentence? This one here. I, I can't read it. Some of us, Some of us have not been it. able to capture. No, but I already responded knowledge. to that. My comment there was we will make the webinar available and the slides, and there's also the glass, the Hunet glass tutorial, and there are also corresponding WHO glass materials, so we will link to those if a link exists. Okay, so maybe if we could just move down this list. How are we, are we going to submit the National Resistance Survey reports into glass, which, which also is something, is the global... I mean, there is something that is called Glass. We always get the email for them. Platform. How how are we going to avoid duplication in such cases? I'm not sure I understand this question. So first of all, is that G L A A S? That's a different Glass from the W H O G L A S S. I'm not familiar with Glass with two A's. Yeah, there is. Anyway, it's two different organizations, so there won't be any duplication. It might be duplication of effort, but the WHO glass data go to the glass platform. And if there is a different project also called GLAAS. Water global analysis and assessment of sanitation. Uh -huh. It's it would just be two different projects without any communication between them. Yes. So you can submit freely to both if there is value to doing that. Yes, I, I do see uh, the next one. Some of the WhoNet tutorials are outdated. Yes, I wrote most of the WhoNet tutorials in one week in 2008, and a lot of them do need to be updated. There are different reasons. One is lack of time. Is 
that's one reason. Another reason is um, we've been modifying so many things in the last two years. I did not want to update the tutorial until we the software were more stable, but I can say we're more stable now. So I, I, I do agree with you. Many of those are out of date, especially things like SAT scan, outbreak detection, reports, where there are many additional features that did not exist in HUNET in 2008. So you are correct. And in the upcoming year, we'll try to get all of them updated. How can countries that are not part of the GLASS platform be part? Well, it depends. You have to be enrolled in GLASS. Um, John has shown you the GLASS web page, and there you can actually see uh, how basically all the steps for a country to be enrolled in GLASS, it has to come from a request from the Ministry of Health or anyway from the government to GLASS with an appointment of a national focal point. Once you are enrolled in GLASS... But I think it starts somebody, a representative of the government, writes to GLASS at exactly. WHO.INT to say, how do I get started? Exactly, yeah, in, in a nutshell, it's like that. And yeah. then WHO will respond back on all of the yeah. next steps. I have a question that I've asked Geneva in the past. That list of countries that I showed earlier on the website is a list of countries. It does not include territories. It does. So it, it didn't in the past, maybe it does now, because there are many important places like Curaçao, American Samoa, uh, the, uh, French Polynesia. These are not countries, but yeah. they're they are important geographic territories. Yeah. So in the report, we always like, you know, and this week we discuss it with legal, legal it's always going to be countries, territories and areas. Yes. Because of course we have Palestine, we have Kosovo, you know. And so well, there's the, a special administrative region exactly. of Hong Kong and Macau. From what I know, though, for example, for the the French Polynesia, that's still under France. Actually, we had a conversation last year about that because we weren't sure if we were actually receiving the data just from the France kind of sort of like territory in Europe. Of that was also, you know, comprising data from, and apparently we do. But um, yeah, it. it is something that it should be looked with a little bit of, of more granular granularity. But as I said, it's it's country, territories and areas. And for, for this, we are very kind of careful when we describe our data. On the you should just write to glass at WHO.INT and, and, and just and pose your question and they will get back to you on that. What I, I've been reassured that they can. They can. The question is, what is the mechanism? The the important thing is that sometimes we get requests from individual like organization or institution. Glass only works with the government, so we cannot enroll like you know private companies or single hospital. It has to be something that comes from the government. Yeah, there were discussions early from Doctors Without Borders (MSF). Mm -hmm because they do collect valuable data from Iraq and Syria, but again, they're not a government, so therefore they cannot share, they cannot submit data as they do not represent the government. Yeah, because all the data from Glass, they have to be actionable. And in a way, we want to assure that the governments are aware um, of the data that are submitted to the global system and that they approve of this data. Although within the country, uh, sometimes different ministers or different groups, they might not even be uh, able to. There was a project actually on the SDG um, goal um, indicators. Uh, I think it was a project in uh, running EMRO where they were trying to set up a database for different ministries and different offices within the government of the country to know what the other colleagues are doing. Because sometimes within the Ministry of Health, um, if you work on TB, you might not know that the colleague on the other side of the door is actually submitting data to GLASS. Yes. You know, so it is also within the government, sometimes there is this little bit of a lack of communication. Yes. I do see a question there about French version of the HUNET documentation. So Adam, at the end of this, just do a control A to copy the entire chat. So we've had a generous offer from someone to help us with the French documentation. And um, we'd be happy to accept these offers because I mentioned we use Google Translate, which is very good, but it's not perfect. As an example, someone said, John, why do we have a specimen type equal to tabure? And tabure, tabure means a small chair. And then I realized what was happening. A small, ch one word for a small chair in English is a stool. <laughs> the problem is the word stool has two meanings in English. Stool equals feces, but stool is also a tabure, a, a small chair. 
So Google Translate did not know the context. So yes, we'd be very happy to work with you on translation of the Hunet software or the documentation or the PowerPoints. We do have some materials. Aussi, je parle français assez bien. J'ai passé deux ans au Mali. J'ai un accent africain français, mais quoi faire? Et también me defiendo bastante espagnol. Entonces, damos muchos cursos en español. And as I was saying earlier, Ahmed speaks Arabic. So those three languages and English, we have people in house. But other languages, we do have close collaborators who are also very much involved. Um, is it possible to quickly demonstrate using backlink? I don't think it's that clear. No, no, I would, uh, so I suggest that the person who was asking about backlink um, just write to us. And there is Hunet. Uh, so let's see. Adam, you're sharing your screen. Can you show Hunet and how to get to the documentation page? I would love myself a little sure. training on backlink again. Yes, and we can do a web and either a webinar or, as I said, a training course, a, a self paced training course. So just click on cancel or open. It doesn't matter. So click on help. And uh, so can you click on about the last option? About doesn't tell you a lot, but it does tell you our email addresses, help at hunet.org or my address. Uh, Adam, we can see whether that's the best WHO website. We may want to put glass. I think we did put glass. On the lower right, it tells you the date that Adam has installed here, Hunet, from 2023, September 26. So if we ever ask you, when is your Hunet from, this will tell you the date that we created it. Because during the year, we change Hunet about every two weeks, tiny things, a new organism, a new antibiotic, something like that. You also saw a 64-bit. There's usually well. not a difference between 64-bit and 32-bit for most people. Sometimes there's a compatibility issue with Office. So if you have a compatibility issue with Office, then let us know. Basically, Hunet runs fine, but if you try to create a Word document, you might get an error message. So most of the time, no, but if you do, it's not a surprise, and we usually can repair that. Okay, the first option there is documentation. And this is simply showing you the Hunet documents folder. And towards the bottom, it says who knows, oh, and the first half are all backlink tutorials. So I suggest the person who asked about backlink, look at these tutorials. Um, there's backlink in Vitech, backlink in Excel, backlink in Meditech, backlink in all of these different systems. Adam, can you now go to the whonet.org training center and you'll be able to see many of these same materials there. We'd be very happy to work with you and teach you one on one or one on a small group about backlink, uh, but not on this call. It just takes a bit more time. When I go to a hospital, I try to teach Hunet to five or 10 or 20 people. Lab, IT, pharmacy, infectious disease, infection control, anybody interested. I usually only teach backlink to one or two people, whoever is responsible for data capture and data management. So Adam is on the website, hunet.org slash training, and you see these same backlink tutorials and you will see the videos once the videos are ready. And we'll just leave it at that because backlink really merits its own, its own session. Other questions? Okay, I've missed your question, Lena, please ask. That was Adam asking, so Adam's asking I think the audience. This one that I have highlighted here was in response to the G-L-A-A-S, so I think it was just a typo. Okay, so it was indeed glass. So uh, what was the question again about duplication? I mean, so I think that Bart mentioned that if you submit the data once, but you want to resubmit the data, they should just write to you to coordinate that. I mean, either you, you decide to keep your submission open and then you start submitting different uploading different data sets and then when you have for example know, blood and stool yeah, and e coli uh -huh. you know and then you know once you have accumulated all the data that you want to submit you can submit and then if you want to change them then you have to ask for permission to change it and where we open it from you and you do it but this i'm not really sure if, if it means different uh -oh. well, the question was about duplication. So I think basically, if it's a very good question about avoiding duplication. If there's any concern, just write to the glass and they'll tell you or they'll permit you, they'll give you guidance on how to avoid duplication. Well, another parenthesis, but I don't know, I don't know how many countries or, or representatives are here from the European Union. Um, you probably know that um, 
for blood samples, um, there are two systems already existing since many years, with our, which are EarsNet and Caesar. Uh, and so we don't, because we don't want country to have to duplicate their submission, we actually receive the data directly from the surveillance system. So we receive the data for blood resistant profile um, from EarsNet and Caesar normally at the end of October, once the data have been validated and we upload them uh, to the platform in bulk, basically. Uh, of course, countries are free to, to submit also directly to GLASS, but we try to avoid that because it's going to be confusing. But some European country, for example, they submit uh, directly to GLASS on other specimens because, uh, as I said, EarsNet and CESAR, they only collect um, data on bloodstream infections. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, I will ask if there are more questions, but I see we're, we have seven minutes left according to time. I'm hoping we're hoping in this upcoming year to be much more proactive at reaching out to you with training opportunities, uh, notifications of uh, new features, new softwares. So we look forward to working with you country wise, also regionally. We feel it's very valuable to take a regional approach for training, technical support, best lessons of what works, what doesn't work. For this to be sustainable, it cannot always be Boston with everything. And, and uh, you know, so we have relied a lot in Latin America, Europe, Asia, people who are providing a lot of the bulk of the first line technical support, and then we provide second and third line. So regional approach and the national, regional approach based on national approaches has been very effective with that. Do you have a GitHub page with your development steps and? No, 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 we do not. We do okay. not. We, so we have the discussion forum okay. um, for purposes of, uh, you know, the communications. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, this question I, here. Uh, excuse me, I cannot have the information to respond to Q5 in the implementation question. Are we still able to submit? Uh, so, OK, this is it's a long conversation, but um, we don't have the time now. Um, we haven't put it mandatory for this year and probably not even for the next year, but at some point, Okay. What is question What's five? Question five, it's about the structure of the healthcare system in the country, uh, independently from surveillance. And I do understand that the national focal point, the work on AMR might not have this information in hand. But at some point, what we would like, we would really make sure, because it's really important to understand what you're covering. So, I mean, at some point, we would like the national focal point to be able to gather this information if it is available at the Ministry of Health level. Of course, if this information is not collected anywhere, so the number of hospital, the number of healthcare facilities that you have in the country, if it's not collected at all, uh, then of course it cannot be reported to anybody, not just glass. But in my experience, for example, MSF has a beautiful maps for many country. You know, I, I was just in South Sudan. They had mapped all the healthcare facility. The government have access to this feature. So I would suggest that, you know, if it's just a problem that the national focal point doesn't know, then I would try and motivate the national focal point to actually go and get this information if it is available. So for now, it's not mandatory, but it's something that it will be it will need to be discussed in the future. The yep. question is Dr. Valu from India. I know I remember my last visit there. Are there any plans to include the filter option and view database? Uh, Adam, you're very familiar with this. Adam, can you open up Hunet? And we have those two different ways to view the database. So, uh, so data entry, there's an option here, number five called view SQL database. Adam did that about three years ago. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it, we're trying to make it closer to Excel with filters and sorting and modern features for editing. So we made this feature for viewing the SQLite database. It, at this point, does not support DBase. So it's unfinished work. So this is this is view database. Um, it, many of you are familiar with view database from Hunet data entry. It looks a lot like this, but this version of view database has more functionality closer to Excel. Uh, we have not yet put it into Hunet data entry because Hunet data entry does both DBase and SQLite. So it's unfinished programming because we're always juggling. What is the priority next? What is the priority next? Why do we, you're asking about the filtering feature. The, a lot, 
we switch from DBase, the, the old DBF structure to SQLite, primarily because Microsoft stopped supporting DBase. It was just giving error messages, not compatible old technology. So DBase was clearly an outdated technology, so we needed to modernize it to something like SQLite, which has many other advantages as well. However, people often liked the DBase structure because they could open up an Excel. Excel did not allow editing of DBase, but allow, Excel allowed filtering, searching, et cetera. So when we went from DBase to SQLite, uh, we lost the filtering feature and we felt it was important, like many of you. So that's why Adam made this feature with the filtering that Dr. Valen is asking about. Um, great, so he's showing an example here of a filter and a find and a replace. For example, if a laboratory code is like my hospital is BWH, but if I want to give you my data, but I want to change it, I might change BWH to 005 for confidentiality purposes. I'm happy to share a lot of my data with you, but not every single detail. So the nice thing with search and replace is I can replace BWH by 005 using this newer feature. So this is the newer one that we would like to do. Adam, can you now go back to data entry? Open an existing data file. View database. This works with both DBase and SQLite. And it, it looks nice, it looks great, it, has, it does a lot of good things. It does editing. The other ones, it doesn't do editing, but this one doesn't do filtering. So basically we're sort of in between. There are some advantages to view database the other way. There are advantages to view database this way, and we just need to finish that work. But we're always juggling and it's hard to come back to something. You ask this question now, and when people ask us a question, it goes up in our list of priorities. If we think it's a good idea, we put it on the list. If other people ask about it, it goes up in the list. If people don't ask about it, it sort of stays at the bottom of the list. Then people ask, ask. Skipped over this one up here um, regarding EarsNet. Okay, I'll make this the, the last I... question because I see it's three o'clock. Um, wh where does it say? Oh, I see. Does this mean that if we declare to EARS, you already have our data? So EARS is the Europe, your EARS net is the European project coordinated by the ECDC. There's a lot of overlap between the EARS net protocol and the GLASS 1.0 protocol. Uh, EARS net is only blood and CSF, and it's eight pathogens that are similar to the WHO eight original pathogens, but they're not identical. So they have organized it in a way that if a European country, Western Europe submits to Caesar, or Eastern Europe or Switzerland and UK submit to Caesar, then ECDC or WHO can send data to WHO Glass for things where they overlap. For example, the ECDC can send the blood data to Glass, but ECDC cannot send the urine data to Glass because EarsNet does not collect urine data. Also, they have to be enrolled in GLASS. Huh? I don't want you to feel that 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 all, we get all the EarsNet and Caesar data. We get the EarsNet and the Caesar data for the country that are enrolled in GLASS. In, in agreement. So ECDC does not send any data to GLASS unless the country requested it or with their permission. So, for example, um, you know, Slovenia may say, GLASS, please submit the, the GLASS, please submit the data we sent to you, send it to GLASS. If they want to do urine, they'll have to do it themselves, or they may say, we're not going to do urine. We will only do the overlap. And there are other people who just decide to do it separately. They report to ECDC what ECDC ears that asked for. And then they will also report to GLASS what GLASS asks for, including the additional specimen types. So ECDC can submit the data where they overlap with the permission and request of the country. Okay, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank Barb for being here. Uh, also hosting. I'm sort of in Germany by accident. I was at a wedding a few days ago. I was on a farm yesterday with my German cousins. And I said, oh, you're in Berlin. Let me come to Berlin. So that's how we're sitting here together. 
I uh, want to thank Adam and the coordination of this call, as well as the work of him and Ahmed and Rob in getting us this far in the project. Thank you for all of the work you've done for GLASS, for the national systems, the local systems, and you'll start to see more opportunities like this from us. And you know, collaborate with us on things that you think would be worthwhile. We cannot take the leadership in everything, but if you take the leadership, we are very happy to provide a supporting role.